All right, folks, welcome back. We're going to finish up this module uh, by basically going in to find out how we're going to configure our overlay management protocol. How do we verify overlay management protocol operations? How do we set up VPN network segmentation? How do we configure our service side routing for VPN? And then finally, how do we verify overlay routing in general, uh, especially in a particular VPN? Now, uh, this is a quite an extensive section here. We're going to see a lot of different commands. I'm going to try and provide you guys as much information as possible on each of these elements so that when you're going back and reviewing this documentation or reviewing the video, hopefully that will provide you enough information to get a good step forward as you move forward for your configuration. Now, we've already talked about this uh, in multiple occasions, but OMP is enabled by default on all of our vEdge routers and our vSmart controllers. OMP has to be operational for the overlay network to function. And if you disable it, you're in essence disabling those overlay network functions and the overlay network itself. So it's very important to understand not necessarily how do we configure or, or enable OMP, uh, but how do we provision the different OMP parameters? Uh, certainly, we can go into our config OMP, we can do a shutdown, we can do a, shut, a no shutdown, but again, the, uh, the concept there is that if you do a shutdown, you're basically, in essence, disabling the SD-WAN, so we don't really want to do that. OMP Graceful Restart, as we talked about in the last lesson, allows OMP peers to continue operating if one of the peers becomes unavailable for whatever reason that might be. If a vSmart controller becomes unavailable, the peer vEdge router is going to continue to forward traffic using that last known good routing information that's received from the vSmart controllers. Additionally, if a vEdge router becomes unavailable, its peer vSmart controller continues to use its last known good configuration that it received from that particular vEdge router. Now, OMP Graceful Restart is enabled by default on our vSmart controllers and the vEdge routers. That default time, and we talked about this and we were talking about our feature overlays, or our feature templates, excuse me, uh, that default Graceful Restart time is 12 hours or 43,200 seconds. Now, when we do have OMP Graceful Restart enabled, the vEdge router and the vSmart controller, basically those two router or two devices that form that OMP peering relationship, they're going to cache the OMP information that's learned from their particular peer. What gets cached? Well, the OMP routes, the TLOC routes, the service routes, any um, uh, IPsec uh, security association parameters and all of our vSmart centralized data policies. When one of the OMP peers is no longer available, the other peer uses that cached information to continue operating in the network. So for example, when a vEdge router no longer detects the presence of an OMP connection to a vSmart controller, the router continues forwarding data traffic using that cached OMP information, all right? So the router also does these periodic checks, right? It periodically checks whether that vSmart controller is available. Maybe it went down, maybe we're trying to see if it's come back. When it does come back up, the vEdge router is basically just going to reestablish the connection to it. The router is going to flush its local cache and it's going to consider only that new OMP information from that controller, from that vSmart controller, as what is valid and reliable, all right? Conversely, the exact same scenario occurs when the vSmart controller no longer detects the presence of that particular vEdge router. OMP Graceful Restart has a timer that tells the OMP peer how long to retain that cached advertised route. So when this timer expires, the cached routes are considered basically no longer valid and OM, the, uh, the OMP peer, whichever peer it might be, flushes those, that information from the routing table. Again, that default timer is 12 hours, 
the range can go anywhere from 1 to 604,800 seconds, uh, which happens to be seven days. I didn't memorize that. I happened to look it up, but it is a pretty extensive time, uh, 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 amount of time, all right? To modify that, va uh, that value, we can, of course, change the feature template that's applied to OMP, or we can go into our config OMP mode and say timers graceful dash restart dash timer and then specify the timer in seconds. That graceful restart timer is set up independently on each OMP peer. That means it's actually set up separately on every relationship between the vEdge router and the, v, uh, the vSmart controller. So let's say, for example, we have a vSmart controller that uses a, great, uh, a graceful restart time of 300 seconds or uh, what is that, um, five minutes, right? And the vEdge router that's configured with that timer uh, has a timer value of 10 minutes or 600 seconds. The vSmart controller retains the OMP route information that it learned from that router for 10 minutes. That means that that graceful restart timer value that is configured on the router and uh, the, uh, takes precedence in this particular case and the router sent to that vSmart controller that timer value when it was doing all of its setup and it was establishing the OMP session. The vEdge router always retains the routes it learns from that vSmart controller for five minutes. That is by default that graceful restart time value that's used on the vSmart controller and that controller sent that information to the router Again, during the whole process of establishing that OMP session, all right? When that vSmart controller goes down and the vEdge router is using its cached OMP information, if you happen to reboot that vEdge router, it's going to lose its cached information and from that point forward, it will no longer be able to forward data until it gets a control plane session reestablished with some vSmart controller in the topology. All right, if you want to disable this particular feature, we just go into config-omp and we say no OMP graceful-restart. All right. Now, another thing that you see in this slide here is how do we advertise routes into OMP? We already talked about what the default advertisements are, right? Connected routes and static routes and OSPF internal routes, intra-area and inter-area routes. And then explicitly, we have to enable uh, routes to go in from BGP and external OSPF. So we, we, we talked about that, pro that process already. All right, now if I want to have those vEdge routers advertise those routes, those uh, BGP or OSPF external routes, I have to tell the vSmart controller to, to, to modify the policy and send that configuration to the vEdge router to advertise those routes. So to configure the routes that the vEdge router advertises into OMP for all the VPNs configured on the router, I go into config-omp and I say either advertise BGP, advertise connected, advertise OSPF, and then I can specify external type one or external type two. I can also go in and say advertise static. I could conversely go no advertise uh, if I wanted to suppress advertisements from happening as well. Now to configure the routes that the vEdge router advertises into OMP for a specific VPN, I would say advertise, and then I would use the aggregate prefix, aggregate only command, and then I would specify either the specific network prefix, BGP routes, connected routes, static routes, OSPF type, and so on. For OSPF, the type can be external. Now with BGP, connected, OSPF, and static options, we can advertise all the learned routes or we can advertise configured routes of those particular types into OMP. To advertise specific routes, instead of advertising all the routes for a particular protocol, we use the network option. 
All right, and then we can specify the prefix of the route that we're going to advertise. And we can see that in the, in the command on the screen here, right? The very last command in the bullet point, okay? Now for individual BPNs, we can aggregate routes from a specified prefix range before we advertise them into OMP. Aggregate prefixes, these, those aggregated prefixes and all of the individual prefixes are going to be advertised by default. Obviously, if our goal is to summarize, which is what an aggregate is, we would want to maybe use the keyword aggregate only to be able to advertise only the aggregate prefixes into the VPN. All right. Let's see, is there anything else I want to mention here? Um, yeah, maybe a couple more things. Uh, route advertisements that you set with the OMP advertise command allows you to apply those to all of the VPNs configured on the router. Router advertisements or route advertisements, I should say, that you set with the VPM OMP advertise command, those are going to apply to a specific VPN, all right? So we do have that option. We can uh, uh, specify OMP advertise to say that we're just going to go ahead and advertise the, the prefixes in, into every VPN, or we can specify a specific VPN. Now, if we do configure route advertisements with both commands, they will both be applied, although one really won't make much of a difference because they're already going to be advertised into all of the VPNs anyway. All right. Now, by default, and by the way, this is not something that we actually see in this particular slide, but I do want to talk about it because it is in the documentation on Cisco's website and it is relevant to this particular discussion. When BGP advertises routes into OMP, because we've explicitly identified that that's going to take place, BGP is going to advertise each of those prefixes metric. All right. We can also inform BGP to advertise the prefixes AS path as well. We actually go into our global configuration mode on the vEdge device. We say VPN, we specify the VPN ID, VPN 1, VPN 2, whatever it might be. And then we say router BGP. And then we uh, that'll take us into the BGP sub configuration mode. So we'll be at uh, config dash BGP. And we just simply say propagate dash AS path. When we configure BGP to propagate the autonomous system path information, the router sends that AS path information to the routers that are behind the vEdge router, meaning the routers that are on the service side of the network, whichever ones, of course, are running BGP. It's going to receive that AS path information, and then, of course, we can use that information internally within BGP to make policy uh, routing decisions within BGP. If you're redistributing BGP routes into OMP, the AS path information is included in the advertised BGP routes. So if we configure BGP AS path propagation on some but not all the vEdge routers in the overlay network, the routers where it was not configured will receive the AS path information, but they're not going to forward it to the BGP routers in their local service side network. So that's kind of important to understand, that distinction anyway. All right, propagating that AS path information allows us to identify a BGP routing loops. Of course, we know BGP by default will drop routes or prefixes where we see our own AS path in the list. And that's what we're talking about in this particular case. All right, uh, one of the other things I wanna talk about before we move on to the next section. In networks that have an overlay network, and an underlay network connectivity. So maybe, for example, it's a vEdge router that has connections uh, to that uh, SD-WAN overlay network and maybe some sort of MPLS underlay network. We can actually assign an autonomous system number to OMP itself. So for the vEdge routers that are running BGP, this overlay AS number is actually included in the AS path of the BGP routing updates. We would actually go into our global configuration mode, go into OMP by typing the OMP keyword, and then we would just simply say overlay, da uh, overlay dash AS, and we would specify that AS number. 
Now that AS number would be configured as a two byte AS dot notation number or a four byte AS dot notation number, just like we have with BGP. So one through 65,535 or 1.0 through 65,535 dot 65,535. Now in my opinion as a best practice, it's really not recommended that the overlay AS number be a unique AS number in both the overlay and underlay networks. All right, I mean, I think I misset stated that actually. It is recommended, not, I think I said not recommended. It is recommended, let me just state it one more time. The AS number that we use and the overlay network and the underlay network, they should be unique. <laughs> Sorry about that, all right? So select an AS number that's not used anywhere else in the network. If we happen to configure the same overlay AS number on multiple VEDGE routers in the overlay network, all of the, those routers are gonna be considered to be part of the same autonomous system. As a result, they're actually not gonna forward any routes that contain the overlay AS number. The mechanism in addition uh, is really just an additional technique that allows us to prevent routing loops in our BGP process in the overall network. All right. So that's just some of the basic concepts to allow us to configure OMP. Not a whole lot of, of tuning options that we have with the protocol itself, but pretty straightforward. Now, what if I wanted to control, say, for example, the number of advertised routes? This is, again, something that we discussed in our previous lesson with regard to how OMP operates and how we can even set up different features of OMP, right? We talked about the fact that VEDGE routers advertise the routes that they learn from their local LAN side to the vSmart controller. The vSmart controller then re redistributes those V routes to the other VEDGE routers through their DTLS sessions in the overlay network. And the routes are advertised are actually a tuple, right? the T-lock tuple that we keep talking about, which is the T-lock used as, in, this, in essence, the next hop for those routes that are being advertised, all right? Uh, system IP address, um, um, uh, uh, color of the VPN, and the tunnel mode, right? GRE or IPsec. Now, a VIAGE router can have up to six different WAN interfaces. Each of those WAN interfaces can have a different T-lock. I know that in the past, I probably mentioned maybe four. Uh, there, are, there is some discrepancy in the documentation about that. Some cases they mentioned four T-locks. Some cases they mentioned six T-locks. Uh, that may be platform specific. I'm not, not, not quite sure why there's a discrepancy about that in the documentation. But in the end, uh, uh, ultimately, it's going to be at least a minimum of four and a maximum of six. All right. Now, remember. A WAN interface is any interface in the transport network, any interface in VPN zero that is actually configured as a tunnel interface. It could be physical interfaces, it could be loopback interfaces, it doesn't really matter, just as long as they're configured as tunnel interfaces. The VEDGE router is gonna advertise each route to T-lock tuple to the vSmart controller in that particular case. Now the vSmart controller then redistributes those routes that it learns from all of the different VEDGE routers, advertising every single route to T-lock tuple to the other VEDGE partners, to the other VEDGE participants. So let's say for example, you have a local site with two different VEDGE routers, a vSmart controller could actually potentially learn up to eight route to T-lock tuples for the same particular route. Now see that example that I just stated is that contradiction that we're talking about, right? Is it a maximum of six or is it a maximum of four? My, uh, my inclination is to simply say that it's a maximum of four uh, and the documentation that I've referenced is, is incorrect. But uh, uh, we'll, we'll go with uh, four for now. We'll see if, uh, if uh, we can do uh, document that a little bit later on. How do I set this limit, right? If I wanna limit the number of route to T-lock tuples that a VEDGE router or a vSmart controller can advertise, I would go into config-omp, 
and I would use the send-path-limit command, and I would specify the limit. All right. What if I want to configure the number of installed OMP paths, what we call ECMP paths, or equal cost multipath routing paths? VEDGE routers install OMP paths that they receive from their vSmart controller into their local routing table. By default, the VEDGE router installs a maximum of four unique OMP paths into the routing table. Now, I know this is correct, because this is pretty typical for an IGP protocol, specifically with IPv4, even though we're not specifically talking about IPv4 in this case. Traditionally with IPv4 ECMP routing, the minimum uh, or the, the default value is four. The minimum of course is one, which would disable ECMP. Uh, and then the maximum would be 16 paths. Well, we see the same thing in this particular case. The maximum number of paths that we can specify will range from one to 16. And we can see the syntax here in the second bullet point. We go into config-omp, ecmp-limit, and then we specify that limit number. All right. Now the whole time, the next thing that we see in the list here is gonna describe how long to wait before we close the OMP connection to a peer. Uh, if the peer, doesn't receive three consecutive Keep Alive messages. This is something that we talked about when we were talking about the feature templates that we were applying for OMP. If the, the peer doesn't receive those three consecutive Keep Alive messages within the whole time period, the OMP connection to that peer is going to be closed. And remember that default hold time is 60 seconds. Go into config OMP. We use the command timers hold time and then we specify the seconds anywhere from zero to 65,535. All right, uh, zero would be in this case would mean that we're just not going to expire. All right, now the keep alive timer is one third the whole time. That value is actually not configurable. So it's kind of the opposite of what we see with some of our IGP protocols where we specify the, the hello interval and then the, the hold value is, or the dead timer is calculated based on the hello interval. It's kind of the opposite in this particular case. All right. Now, if the local device and the peer end up having different hold times, we always select the higher value. So this is a negotiated value, unlike OSPF where the timers have to match. In this particular case, the OMP timers can be negotiated and they're always negotiated to the higher value. The whole time has to be at least two times the hello tolerance interval uh, that is set on that WAN tunnel in our transport VPN, VPN zero. To configure the hello tolerance on the interface, we use the hello tolerance command. All right, we don't actually see that on this particular slide. It's probably a value that you're not gonna end up changing too much, uh, but um, it, you know, you may run into a specific scenario where you have to modify that information. The next thing we have here, we actually have two different things here, configuring the OMP update advertisement interval and the uh, end of rib timer, all right? By default, OMP sends update packets every second. So it is a periodic protocol, uh, much like a traditional distance vector routing protocol. We can change that timer. It can be anywhere from zero to 65,535. Uh, I'm not actually sure what the impact of setting it to zero would be in this particular case. Certainly zero is a special use case and I can't recall uh, what the impact of that would be because certainly we have to send updates regardless. Uh, maybe zero says we're gonna send triggered updates. I don't know, that's entirely a guess by the way. Uh, so don't quote me on that, but uh, certainly zero would be a special use case scenario. Go into config-omp, specify the timers command, timers, advertisement-interval, and specify the value in seconds. The end of rib timer, all right? Let's say, for example, an OMP session goes down and then it comes back up, all right? That's, this is the scenario that we're talking about in this particular case. The end of rib timer is sent after five minutes, meaning after 300 seconds. There's a little marker that gets sent. And after this marker is sent, 
any routes that were not refreshed after the OMP session came back up, they're going to be considered to be stale routes and they're actually going to get deleted from the route table. To modify this timer, which I don't generally recommend, is uh, go into config-omp, timers, EOR-timer, and set it in seconds. Like I said, 300 seconds is the default. Uh, that range can be anywhere from 1 to 3600 seconds, which is one hour. All right. Now we can verify the operation of OMP by using things like show OMP peers, show OMP routes, show OMP services, show OMP summary, show OMP, uh, OMP T lock, uh, or T locks, I should say. So we'll take a look at that in the next part of this section here. All right. So these are the commands that I was just referencing, show OMP peers. It's gonna give me all the information about the peering sessions that I have active. We can, of course, see this in the vManage NMS as well under the network uh, visibility view, but uh, we're gonna see all the local uh, vSmart controller connections and the vEdge routers, show OMP routes. Uh, this is gonna display all the information about those V routes. Uh, we do this on our vSmart controllers and vEdge routers, of course. Uh, those OMP routes carry information, like I said, about the different routing protocols, the local network, BGP, OSPF, directed, uh, directly connected routes, uh, summary routes, uh, aggregate routes, I should say, static routes, and so on. Again, not all those routes come in automatically, but if they do exist, this is how we're going to see them. Show OMP service. This is going to give us all of the services that are learned from the vSmart controller uh, and uh, through our OMP peering sessions, this would be for service chaining, uh, if we're gonna be doing any kind of service-based routing. Uh, show OMP summary gives me just the basic information about the, the sessions that are running between the vSmart controllers and the vEdge routers. And then show OMP T-locks, as suspected, would give me all the information about the T-lock route advertisements over my OMP sessions between the vEdge and the vSmart controllers. So most of these commands, in fact, almost all of these commands are, are specific to vSmart controllers and vEdge routers. You wouldn't run them on a vManage device or on a vBond orchestrator. Now our next discussion is quite uh, more involved uh, and I'm not sure how much detail I wanna get into in this particular case uh, with regard to segmentation, we understand what the general concept, right? Uh, it's a way of, for us to, at the edge of the network, on the vEdge routers, perform segmentation by uh, displaying or, or isolating specific traffic inside of a particular VPN, all right? Uh, each router, each vEdge router in our topology has an OMP connection over a DTLS tunnel or a TLS tunnel for, to our vSmart controller, and it's gonna propagate its routing information to that vSmart controller. On the vSmart controller, us as an administrator can enforce policies to drop routes, to change T-lock information, which are basically the overlay next hops that we have. And we would do that for things like traffic engineering or service chaining, we can do it, uh, do it to change the VPN ID uh, based on policy overviews uh, or policy decisions, I should say, in the network, uh, and so on. We can apply these policies both inbound and outbound on our vSmart controller. Now, all prefixes that belong to a single VPN are going to be kept in a separate routing table. We actually talked about this when we went through our segmentation section in the last section. This is providing us a layer three isolation that's required for all of the different segments in the network. All right, so one vEdge router might have uh, two or three different VPN routing tables, another vEdge router might have one or two, and so on. The separate routing tables, much like we see with something like a VRF and MPBGP for a layer three MPLS VPN, that's gonna separate routing tables to provide isolation on a single node. Now the question that we have is how do we propagate that routing information across the network? We do this with VPN IDs. 
and the VPN IDs, as we mentioned, are gonna be carried in the messages to the vSmart controller. So we don't have to get into the, uh, the specifics, if you will, of setting up, uh, or excuse me, of the, the details of, of what segmentation is, because we've gone through all those details in a previous lesson. So let's focus our attention in this section here on how do we actually configure those segments. VPNs are um, in, in the Viptelis system, divide the network into different segments. Now, by default, two VPNs exist in the system. And we talked about the details of those VPNs as well. VPN 0, which is our transport VPN, uh, and VPN 512, which is our out-of-band management VPN. Now, to segment user networks and user data traffic locally at each site, and to interconnect user sites across our overlay network, we have to create additional VPNs on our vEdge routers. These VPNs are anything but VPN 0 through VPN 512. So to enable the flow of data traffic, we have to associate interfaces with each of those VPNs, assigning an IP address to the interface, and then of course associating them to the VPN. And that's what we're seeing in this particular case, all right, uh, and in the kind of the bullet points that we see here, all right, these interfaces connect to the local side networks, not to the transport cloud. So for each of these VPNs, we can set other interface specific parameters or properties. We can configure features that are specific for a particular user segment. Maybe it's BGP routing on that segment. Maybe it's OSPF. Maybe we want to establish some sort of QoS policy, traffic shaping policy, policing, whatever. And we saw this actually when we were going through our feature template section, we saw those little, uh, those configuration elements within the interface configuration of the VPN configuration. All right. Now we're gonna just talk about the basic configuration procedures for the three different types of VPNs. We're not gonna get into uh, you know, those additional enhancements, the QoS and everything else. Uh, it's just basically getting these VPNs set up. All right. Now, it's not documented on the slide here, but I do want to go through uh, configuring the transport VPN first because that, of course, is one of, one of the most important VPNs that we're going to set up. Uh, it's, it's, you know, for that control plane, right? For the control plane to establish itself so that the overlay network can function, we have to configure interfaces in VPN zero to carry all that control traffic to establish and maintain that overlay network. So on our vEdge routers, interfaces in VPN zero connect to some type of transport to the cloud. It could be an internet connection, it could be an MPLS connection, Metro Ethernet, 3G, 4G, whatever, LTE or whatever. For each interface, that we assign to VPN zero, we have to set an IP address and we have to create a tunnel connection that sets the color and the encapsulation for that particular transport. Remember, those are the elements of the, of the T-lock, right? IP address, color, and, and, and transport mode, right? Or encapsulation, I should say. And the encapsulation can either be IPsec that provides authentication, encryption, etc or it could just be simply GRE if we're not concerned about authentication and encryption, all right? Those three parameters define that T-lock, like I said, on the vEdge router. The OMP session that ends up running on each tunnel sends that T-lock information to the vSmart controller so that it can learn what the overlay network topology looks like. All right, now we could set other interface specific and VPN specific properties for VPN zero. It's not just limited to the tuple uh, to create the T-lock information. Uh, we can uh, configure other parameters. Now, the vSmart controllers themselves are responsible for determining the best routes through the overlay network based on those T-locks that it learns and based on whatever central policies that we have configured they handle only the control plane traffic in VPN zero. A, v, uh, a vSmart controller can actually have only one interface in VPN zero, uh, and that's where you set the IP address that you create for that particular tunnel connection. 
Again, that is the control plane tunnel termination point. Now on the VEDGE router, VPN0 connects to a WAN trans transport network as well. And we have to have at least one tunnel interface on that VEDGE router so that it can join the control plane and participate in the, the overlay network. If it's not configured, the router simply can't par uh, participate in the control plane and, and it can't participate in the SD-WAN fabric. All right. Just like we saw on the vSmart controller, if I'm going to configure the VPN0 components on the vEdge device, I'm going to have the tuple as well, the T-lock, the IP address, the, the tunnel color, and the encapsulation. And the T-lock performs the same function in this case that it did on our vSmart device. In the uh, VPN0, the vEdge routers can actually be configured for dual stack meaning that they can run IPv4 and IPv6 addresses on the, on the tunnel interface. Uh, and then we can learn from the vSmart controller whether or not the destinations that we're trying to communicate to uh, support either v4 or v6. Uh, and then the router's gonna choose v4 or v6 uh, T-locks based on wherever we're trying to communicate to. So we don't see it on this particular slide, although um, uh, it is kind of, well, alluded to here, I suppose you could say. We go into vEdge, we go into our global configuration mode. For the WAN transport interface, we simply type in VPN0, interface, and then specify the interface name. Uh, typically, that could be a gigabit ethernet port, it could be an IPsec number, a loopback number, a NAT pool number, and so on. The next thing we have to do is configure a static v4 address for the interface. We just simply use the IP address prefix slash length command. And if we want to enable DHCP on the interface, we could do that as well. Uh, in that case, we would use the IP DHCP client command. And then we'd have to say DHCP distance or optionally, I guess we could say DHCP distance and then specify a distance number. Uh, the, even though it's kind of out of the scope of what we're talking about right here, if an interface learns its address from DHCP, it can also learn routes from that server. And we had something that we talked about in one of our previous sections where we actually kind of alluded to this when we were talking about DHCP. Uh, it was actually when we were talking about the administrative distance in the last lesson, right? We said DHCP learned routes. Those are going to have an administrative distance of one which is the same as a static route. All right, now we could change that by specifying that DHCP distance option for the IP DHCP client command, which is an interface specific command. All right, if we wanna do dual stack, we could do the IPv6 address prefix and length. Same thing for IPv6 for DHCP client. We would say IPv6 DHCP dash client. We could again specify the DHCP distance. Uh, it's still one for IPv6. Uh, and it can be set anywhere from 1 to 255. And we can also do the rapid commit, right, where we just get a solicit and reply uh, as opposed to the solicit, advertise, reply, and acknowledgement. So we can kind of go into the uh, rapid DHCP process. Make sure you do the no shutdown. That's a very important command, right? The no shutdown command is very important uh, because uh, by default these interfaces are turned off. Now we have to set up the WAN uh, transport tunnel connection. So this is where we're gonna be specifying the color and the encapsulation. So we actually, under the physical interface, we're gonna type the command tunnel-interface. And then we're gonna configure the color of the tunnel. Now there's a bunch of different colors that we have. The default color is default, uh, but we have things like blue, bronze, gold, green, MPLS, private one through private six, public internet, red, silver, uh, metro ethernet, MPLS, private one through private six. Those are gonna be my private colors because they use private addresses to connect to the remote side vEdge routers in a private network. Uh, we could use those colors in a public network if there's no NAT device uh, between the local and, and edge um, or remote vEdge routers, all right? Next, we would specify the encapsulation that we're going to use. In this case, it's most likely going to be encapsulation IPsec, but it could be a GRE, and you can actually do both. 
if you do IPsec and GRE, you're basically going to end up creating two different T-locks that have the same IP address and color, but they just simply have different encapsulation types. We can also go in and specify other properties of the interface, things like DNS. We can do static routes if we want to do a static route, IP route or IPv6 route, uh, where we specify the prefix uh, and the length, and then we specify the next hop, and we can even set the administrative distance on those static routes if we want. Uh, also make sure that you activate the configuration. All right, you want to activate the configuration by typing the commit command. To display all this information, to make sure it's working, show interface will help, uh, show IPv6 interface, show DHCP interface, uh, show IPv6 uh, DHCP interface, and so on. All right. So that's the that's tunnel zero, but really most of this stuff applies to what we're doing um, in the uh, uh, to what we're doing on the regular VPN interfaces as well. Uh, now, but everything that I talked about up to this point has to do with what we're doing on the V Edge device. It doesn't have to do with what we're doing on the V Smart controller. But I'm going to tell you this: the V Smart controller configuration is pretty much the same. We're going to go into our global config. We're going to say VPN zero interface, specify the interface name, give it an IP address. If we want to use DHCP, of course, we can do IPv6 as well. We can uh, do a no shutdown. So pretty much the configuration on our vSmart controllers uh, is, is uh, pretty much the same. All right. We would still have to specify our tunnel interface uh, and so on. Now, what you're looking at on this particular slide, uh, you know, we would also configure VPN 512. Uh, that one's pretty simple because you just simply go into VPN 512, tell it what interface it belongs to, specify the IP address, or use DHCP if you want to, and do a no shutdown. So that's a pretty straightforward uh, interface to configure. To configure VPNs to carry uh, customer traffic, data traffic, right? Uh, the, the data traffic that goes from site to site. Uh, we have to use a VPN that isn't 0 or 512. That's what we're seeing depicted on this slide here. We go into global configuration mode. We type VPN and specify a number anywhere from 1 to 511 or 513 to 65,535. We have to configure at least one interface in that VPN. So we say interface, interface name. Uh, again, that would be like gigabit ethernet and then specify the slot or the port. Uh, usually that's gonna be generally a, a zero through a seven. Uh, and then the port number is uh, for the slot anyway. And then the port number I think is usually zero through eight or zero through nine. I think it's zero through eight, right? Uh, and if we're configuring VLANs, uh, we can specify sub-interfaces uh, by typing slot and port and then dot and then the VLAN number. And that VLAN number in our case can be anywhere from 1 to 4094. All right. The interface name uh, can also be a GRE or IPsec, loopback, etc. Uh, but just depends on what we're configuring. All right. So we put in interface, interface name, put in the IP address, the prefix. We do a no shutdown to make sure that the interface comes up. We could put in a DNS IP address if we want to make sure that uh, we can do DNS resolution or enable the DNS service in that VPN. We can also do static routes with IP route or IPv6 route. And again, with the static route, we have the option of specifying the prefix, the prefix length, the next hop, and the administrative distance. And then finally, we have to make sure that we commit our changes. Like I said, if we want to run dual stack, we have that capability as well. All right. By the way, the documentation walks you through this process as well. Most of this course, sorry about that, most of this course has been built on the documentation. Uh, so you'll see a lot of references. In fact, a lot of what I'm saying is directly from that documentation because 
quite frankly, that's that's what we use to, to build our SD-WAN fabric. So it's a it's a very useful uh, information. Now, service side routing is you know the basic routing that we would run on the service side of the network. It could be OSPF. That's a pretty common protocol that we can see. So we can enable OSPF on the service VPN. We can also redistribute OMPF, o OMP routes, excuse me. We talked about that in our last lesson into OSPF and so on. So you do see kind of the, a snippet of the configuration here. We go uh, into the VPN by specifying the VPN and then the VPN ID. Uh, anything but 0 and 512 because 0 is our transport VPN. And there's no reason to run any server-side routing over that because it's only control traffic. A VPN 512 is our management VPN. So to configure OSPF area 0 as an example, and then the interfaces that are participating in that area, under config-vpn, we simply say router OSPF area 0, specify the interface and the interface name, uh, and then the IP address uh, and the uh, address of the interface, and then do a no shutdown. And then that will uh, include that interface into uh, in the OSPF uh, domain. Then we simply type exit. If we wanted to redistribute OMP, OMP routes into OSPF, we just simply type redistribute OMP. All right. Now, remember, we're talking about routes coming from OMP going into the service side network. OSPF to OMP happens automatically as long as it's not an external route. But uh, VPN routes going into the service side local routing doesn't happen by default. So we would have to go into our OSPF process and say redistribute OMP. Uh, and, and by the way, that the, the default properties that get applied, you know, the default cost is 20, it's an external type 2, those kinds of things. That still applies in this particular case. And we can apply route maps and filters and, and redistribution processes to change those behaviors. But that's just a standard IGP uh, redistribution process. So we'll just take a look at what we would see with the other routing protocol that's possible in this topology, which is BGP, right? Uh, we would configure the local AS number. Uh, so we go in to configure the VPN under global config, say VPN, and then specify the VPN ID, in this case VPN1. Uh, again, any service-side VPN, anything except 0 and 512. We configure B, uh, BGP to run in the VPN by configuring the local autonomous system number, router BGP, local AS, and the AS can be either the, the 2-byte version or the 4-byte version, depending on whatever you decide to run. Then we configure the BGP peer by specifying its address, the autonomous system number, which is our remote AS, and then enable the connection to the peer by using the neighbor address remote AS command, and then we simply do a no shutdown. Uh, to configure the system IP address on the vEdge router, which we would have to have for this to work, we would go into the system configuration and use the system system IP address command. You see that in the snippet there. I'm not really adding an additional any additional kind of information here, but that gives you the, uh, the idea of what we're talking about in this particular case. So the last thing we look at here is really just how do we verify this? We can do a show BGP neighbor, which is going to give me all of my BGP neighbors on our vEdge routers. Show IP route uh, or show IP routes gives me all the v4 route entries uh, in the local routing table. If we did this on the vSmart controller, uh, we would see all the forwarding information as well. Uh, we can see that information, by the way, in the vManage NMS as well. Show OSPF neighbor. Again, on our vEdge routers only, we're going to see a list of all of our neighbors. All right. So in this lesson, we just uh, talked about uh, really uh, how does OMP get enabled on our vEdge and vSmart devices. Uh, OMP uh, you know, obviously has to be operational, but we can tune it and we can configure different parameters. Uh, we have operational commands that can be executed. We can configure segmentation uh, on our service VPNs. Uh, we can also enable uh, routing protocols on the service side routing for OSPF and BGP and static routing. And then we have several commands that we can use to verify that information. 
which by the way, concludes this module. It was a good module. We talked about a lot of different information in this module. What is an overlay network? What is the overlay management protocol? What is it, what is it used for? How do we manage information in the overlay network by using OMP? We talked about the, 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 what is the concept of a TLOC, unicast and multicast destinations, service routes, uh, and so on. We talked about how do we advertise OMP routes, uh, you know, between uh, the TLOCs and the service routes, between our vEdge devices and our vSmart controllers, how OMP routes can, uh, you know, contain all the routing information, but they also contain other information, those TLOC tuples like we talked about, services and, and uh, for, for service chaining, uh, policy decisions that the vSmart controller is pushing down based on the configuration. We talked about how we can automatically redistribute connected, static, and OSPF intra-area routes, OSPF inter-area routes, and we learn about those locally from our routing peers. BGP and OSPF external routes have to be explicitly configured and redistributed. We talked about that as well. Uh, we talked about a lot of things about what are the origin types and what is the algorithm for selecting a route, what is administrative distance, how is that going to affect our routing decisions in the next we wrapped up by talking about OMP segmentation or using VPNs at least on the service side uh, to segment data traffic and then we talked about the VPN zero transport VPN for our control traffic and our management VPN which was 512. All right so we talked about quite a bit of things in this lesson here. Let's go ahead and do our knowledge check and then we'll wrap up this lesson and we only have one more module left before we've completed the course. All right. So the first question here is the Cisco SD-WAN secure extensible network is controlled by, and we have to choose one. Uh, is it BGP? Is it overlay control protocol, overlay management protocol, or the SD-WAN control protocol? Obviously we know in this case, uh, well, it, it is the overlay management protocol. At least that's what most people would think to select, right? Uh, let's read the question one more time. The Cisco SD-WAN Secure Extensible Network is controlled by, and I don't know, let's see, which one do we have here? Um, I would say in this particular case that the correct answer would have to be the overlay management protocol right? That's what we've been talking about the entire time. But is BGP part of this process? I guess it depends on what you're considering to be part of that secure extensible network. I'm going to go with the overlay management protocol in this case, because that's essentially what the entire module is about. So I'm assuming that's what they're trying to reference in this particular case, which is not a key role of OMP. Distribution of authorized vEdge devices, distribution of data plane security parameters, distribution of routes, or distribution of routing policies. So in this particular case, I would say that the distribution of authorized edge vEdge devices is not really something that's going to apply here, right? Um, distribution of authorized vEdge devices doesn't really make any sense. We don't authorize vEdge devices. The, 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 the configuration in vManage and our vSmart DTLS configurations allow us to connect vEdge devices to the network, but it's not part of OMP specifically. OMP only runs after the devices are authorized and we don't distribute that information afterwards. All right, so the answer in this case, which is not a key role, would be A, the distribution of authorized vEdge devices. Number three, OMP advertises the following types of routes. Definitely connected routes, uh, service routes, for sure, right? We know that we're going to have service routes that are part of that. Uh, I would say the last one would probably be TLOC information even though it's not really technically a type of route, uh, it would be something that I would definitely advertise as part of the process. 
right? Uh, we're supposed to choose three in this particular case. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going back and forth between connected routes and OMP routes. OMP routes is kind of more generic, right? OMP routes include things like connected routes, static routes, EIGRP, I mean, not EIGRP, OSPF and, and uh, BGP if we decide to. So I'm going to stick with that because connected routes would be included in that. So the answer in this case would be uh, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. Definitely service routes. Those are the routes from the service side VPNs, our TLOC information for sure, our OMP routes, which would include those connected routes. So uh, that's kind of a trick question uh, because connected routes are technically included, which is not an attribute advertised by an OMP route. Oops, sorry about that. Which is not an attribute that's advertised by an OMP route. A TLOC, we know that is, system IP, site ID, or VPN ID. Uh, well, we know that system ID is going to be advertised. We know that the TLOC is going to be advertised. Uh, I would say, uh, actually, the system IP, so we're running kind of into the same situation that we had before, where the TLOC includes that information. Uh, so site ID and VPN ID would definitely be included in an OMP advertisement. The TLOC is going to include the system IP as well as the color and the VPN encapsulation. So uh, in this case, I would say system IP is not an attribute. Which type of route does OMP not automatically redistribute? We know it's static and the internal OSPF routes so it does not automatically redistribute those OSPF external routes. The VPN identifier is carried in the data packet in the form of an MPLS label. Uh, is that true or false? Now we did talk about the concept of, of labeling, right? And in this case, it's true. Even though we may not be running MPLS, we still identify the VPN using a similar format. So that is true. If OMP is disabled on the VEDGE router, only static routes and connected routes will be advertised into the network. Well, that's actually false, right? Nothing will get advertised because if OMP is disabled, I can't join the fabric. Uh, which routing protocols can be configured in a service VPN? Uh, on the service side, we would only be able to choose OSPF and BGP. EIGRP and ISIS are not gonna be supported. All right, so that leaves us with basically one module left. We have four lessons left, policy overview and framework, uh, QoS, uh, policy operation, and then uh, that's it. All right, so we'll see you guys in the last module in a little bit.